Middle Relief with Mario and Musso on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. What's up, people? Welcome in to hour number three of Middle Relief. Mario Jerez alongside Jeremy Hill, Casey on the audio board, Paul O'Neill getting us on the YouTube. Y'all know what time it is. Time for our daily countdown to kickoff segment. But before I get into that, I do just want to quickly address uh, this report from Mike Scarborough, which I did see. Uh, apparently, he reports that Coach O and uh, LSU's athletic director, Scott Woodward, might still be fighting to keep Dare Rosenthal and getting him to stay at LSU. But to, to be honest and to be candid with y'all, there's not, not much other information to support that besides Mike Scarborough's article. And Mike Scarborough's article on TigerBait.com has a paywall, so I'm not able to read it. But what I will say is you guys heard Coach O earlier on this show and on OTB saying that he wishes Dare Rosenthal the best. And it looks like he is gone as an LSU Tiger. But that Mike Scarborough report is out there and we'll continue to update it as we go. But right now, there's nothing to really support it. And I'd rather not get into it because besides Mike Scarborough, nobody else is really saying that Dare Rosenthal has a chance to stay at LSU. It seems that he's gone. It seems like he's going to hit the transfer portal. And there, again, a lot of conflicting reports out there because since that Mike Scarborough report has come out, you've had people write about him maybe going to Florida or about Dare Rosenthal going to Baylor. So again, conflicting reports. I did see the report, but don't have uh, much other information to offer there. So transitioning here, we are 66 days away from LSU and UCLA inside of the Rose Bowl. Jeremy Hill, we're getting... Closer and closer. Real exciting stuff. Yeah, most definitely, man. I, you can almost smell it in the grass in the morning. Uh, you just get that feeling when football season's approaching. I'm super excited for the Tigers to roll out there next season. Smell it. Don't eat it. <laughs> yeah, most definitely not eating it. So there's no number 66 on the roster this year, and I do have to shout out somebody in the chat whose name is not handy right now, but somebody pointed out that one Alan Fanica wore number 66 for LSU, and he's an LSU legend. No other way to say it. Jay Hill playing for the Tigers from 1994 to 1997 and in the 1997 game against Florida which is one of the iconic games in LSU history when they upset the number one ranked Florida Gators who were led by Steve Spurrier uh, Fanica was pushing people around that game he was a big reason why LSU was able to win that game and then he carried over that success from college into the NFL getting drafted in the first round in the 1998 NFL draft played for the Steelers the New York Jets and the Arizona Cardinals in that time, Fanica was a six-time first-team All-Pro and a nine-time Pro Bowl selection, and he's got the ring to validate it. Won the Super Bowl with the Steelers in Super Bowl 40 when they took down the Seattle Seahawks. He was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2021, and as of May of this year, he is the head football coach of Frank W. Cox High School in Virginia, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Alan Fanica is somebody who's an NFL legend and an LSU legend. And as we're 66 days away from UCLA and LSU in the Rose Bowl, we had to remember his career. Most definitely. Just a stud offensive lineman. One of the guys you definitely remember uh, through LSU being an All-American uh, offensive lineman, which we don't have many of. Uh, being a first-team All-SEC guy and also winning the uh, Jacobs Blocking Trophy. I think uh, his career is definitely heralded. Um, I definitely don't remember him. I was a little, a little bit before my time, but I definitely remember his NFL career, and he was definitely a stud out there, and it was a pleasure to watch him. Okay, so I probably did not get need to get creative with this segment because we could have just talked about Alan Fanica the whole time because his career was so good. But when I look at LSU and the number 66, it is significant, Jeremy, because LSU has played the University of Arkansas a total of 66 times. And in that series, LSU is 42, 22, and 2 overall. Arkansas has not beaten LSU since they beat them 31 to 14 back in 2015 inside a Tiger Stadium. That game was not fun at all. LSU won the first ever meeting between the two schools 15 to 0 back in 1901. So they've been playing for a really long time. And the Golden Boot has been at stake in this game ever since 1996. And ever since that trophy was introduced, LSU is 16 and 8. And this is a rivalry that's a little bit one-sided, not an opinion. You saw the record, 42 and 22, but it is a great rivalry, Jeremy. And I've, I've grown to respect Arkansas a little bit over the years. They've had some very memorable games for LSU, some games where LSU came out on top and somewhere Arkansas shot the world and upset LSU. But when you think of this series, when you think of this rivalry, when you think of good memories when it comes to LSU versus Arkansas, what comes to your mind? Uh, most definitely. Uh, nothing but good memories for me. I, I had the pleasure of never losing to Arkansas. That would have been a huge bummer if that happened. But um, Okay, I was going to say humble <laughs> brag, but then the brag turned yeah. into not so humble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but I definitely remember uh, those battles with them. I definitely remember the overtime game when McFadden was going off and just yelling at my TV. We couldn't stop him. And we still won the national championship that year, but I definitely remember that game. I remember also... Um, 
just going up there uh, my freshman year, it was super cold for an SEC game. I just remember my toes almost freezing off, and you just don't get those feels for SEC game. We came out with the W, which was good, and I also remember my last game in Tiger Stadium happened to be against Arkansas, and we got the W on that as well, so that was cool. And you had one play that you wanted to reference oh, yeah. against oh, yeah. the Razorbacks. What was that play? Oh, nice little 55-yard touchdown. You know, we were down, and we needed a play, and um, – you know, the offensive line did a phenomenal job just blocking everybody up, and um, they just gave me a wide open hole to hit, and I just, next thing you know, I'm in the end zone, you know, the Tiger fans yelling and, and celebrating, and that was a, a really fun moment for me as a Tiger. And we can see it here on the screen. A la yarda 30, a la yarda 20, Jeremy Hill, yarda 10, hasta luego! <laughs> Touchdown, LSU! That's actually how it sounded, because I actually called this game. Really cool. Hey. New Jersey's that year. Yep. You long guys. Stripes, long stripes. I actually like the long stripes. A lot of people don't like them, but I actually like the long stripes on the shoulders. That was a great memory. And there's many great memories when it comes to LSU versus Arkansas. You brought up the 2007 game, which was not a good memory, but very memorable. I think Darren McFadden is still running. But <laughs> yeah. the cool thing about that is LSU lost that game and still won the national championship with two losses. So that's one that Arkansas fans are never going to forget, one that LSU fans are never going to forget. I saw somebody in the chat uh, bring up the hit that Chad Jones had against Arkansas oh, yeah. back in 2009. And yeah. when it comes to this rivalry, I think that game is a little bit underrated. Mm -hmm. LSU wins 33-30 to 30 in overtime. We all remember that hit by Chad Jones and Trendon Holiday in his last game yeah. inside of Tiger Stadium ran back a punt. And I remember those gold jerseys, too. Those were tight. Yeah, I was at that game, actually, as a recruit. So that was a super cool game to watch and watching Chad make that huge hit. I think he got flagged on the play, actually, which was a bummer. But um, that game was super exciting to watch. I think it was another uh, senior night in Death Valley, which is super cool because you can just feel the energy. All the fans know this is our last time to, to make our impact this season. And they definitely showed up and showed out. But that was a definitely cool game to be at. And another game, I believe this might have been before you were here, but 2011, LSU versus Arkansas. The Tigers are trying to cap an undefeated season, and people forget how good Arkansas was that year under Bobby Petrino and with Tyler Wilson at the helmet quarterback. They came into that game with one loss, ranked number three in the country, and they get up 14-0 to early in that game against LSU, but then LSU comes back and just destroys Arkansas. You have several Tyron Matthew memories yeah. in that game when it comes to the 92-yard punt return and also uh, the forced fumble. He might have had multiple forced fumbles in that game. But the lasting image, and what I want to ask you about, is the exchange between Bobby Petrino and Les Miles on the field towards the end. I will never, ever forget Les Miles extending his hand and then Bobby Petrino just yelling at him, yelling vulgarities <laughs> at him. And then Coach Miles' expression, he was just like, did that really just happen? That <laughs> yeah. That is a memorable game. And after Arkansas lost that game to LSU, the whole motorcycle incident happens, and they kind of fall uh, down the tube there. But that is a memorable game as well. Most definitely. I was another game I, I had the pleasure of being at as a recruit, um, being able to watch that game very closely. And I just remember Tyron just making play after play. I think he had a forced fumble, that punt return. And um, it, it got ugly in the second half. And I just remember that's probably what he was mad about, them running up the score on him. But, you know, once you're playing well, you want to keep that momentum going, especially going into the SEC championship. And that's exactly what uh, what they did. The game last year was pretty close between LSU and Arkansas. And I do want to get a little bit into the current Razorbacks. But I do want to remember one more game. And back in 2013, we already talked about it. Anthony Jennings is not a very memorable quarterback in the pantheon of LSU history, frankly. But what he did on that day was really, really impressive. To go in as a freshman, LSU is trailing by a touchdown in that game. They take over on the one-yard line, and Jennings gets them down the field 99 yards, culminating in a touchdown pass to Traven Durall. At that time, Brett Belim, I believe, was still looking for his first SEC win, and this was going to be a loss that was really, really bad for LSU. It wasn't going to be good, a good thing for Les Miles either if they lost that game. But... LSU rallied in the grand scheme of things. The victory didn't mean that much, but it's one that I'll never forget. Most definitely. That was a, uh, definitely a cool experience. I don't I don't remember too many like walk-off game-winning touchdowns in the game, especially uh, a 99-yard drive, to be exact. Um, that was just a cool experience to be a part of, just watching the crowd go crazy, and, uh, and especially a senior night for a lot of guys. Um, that game was a, definitely a fun experience for me. i got to ask you now about the Golden Boot itself before we move <laughs> yeah. on to the current Arkansas Razorbacks. Shout out to John DeLon in the chat who says the Golden Boot is the most gaudy rivalry trophy in all of college football. <laughs> I'd rather play for the Iron Skillet. I completely disagree with John. I love the Golden Boot. It's huge. You can see its significance just by its size. And honestly, this is going to be a really hot take. People might get mad at me. But in 2019, when, uh, when Joe Burrow and those guys went in there, 
and or, or they played here in Baton Rouge. Yeah, Arkansas comes to Baton Rouge. LSU drums them on the field, and LSU didn't even go get the trophy after the game, <laughs> which I get why they were doing. Okay, that's not our goal. We're trying to win the championship. We beat Arkansas. We don't care. But again, I have a lot of respect for this tradition, this rivalry. I wish they would have at least made the effort to go across the field and get the boot. But that's what I think about it. Do you think the Golden Boot is the most gaudy rivalry trophy in all of college football? <laughs> I wouldn't go gaudy, but it's definitely a, a, a fun a fun matchup. I mean, it's SEC football. If you, I'm sure if you look at the scores, it's a lot of one-score games in there between us and the Razorbacks just because of the rivalry and just the states are being bordering and things like that. You get a lot of guys playing over there and a lot of guys from there here. So um, it, it's cool to me. I, I don't mind it. I think anytime you get bragging rights, it's definitely a cool thing to have in sports. Yeah, for sure. And for Arkansas last year, getting three wins in the SEC was a really cool thing. And I don't mean to be dis disrespectful, but for a program that goes 1-23 in, in the SEC from 2017 to 2019, to get three in the same season, you know, is a pretty good thing. And a lot of them were close, and one was decided because of a bad call. They got screwed in the Auburn game when Bo Nix clearly threw the ball backwards. It should have been a fumble. Arkansas should have been able to ice the clock and win the game, but that didn't happen. So... My point is, they're three and three and seven last year. Isn't going to jump off the page, but that's the most success Arkansas has had in a really long time, and they're pretty pumped up for what Sam Pittman is doing down there. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, Arkansas is going in the right direction. Obviously, they haven't had the success that they like to have, but um, they definitely uh, are going to be a team that I don't think is going to have a chance to win the SEC West. But um, we'll see what happens. You never know. Each year, uh, each team brings a different thing, a different energy. We'll see what the Razorbacks have this fall. The game this season will be in Baton Rouge, November 20th, LSU versus Arkansas, 66 days away from kickoff. That's why we're talking so much about the Razorbacks. LSU has played Arkansas 66 times. The Tigers 42 and 22 in those games. Also, shout out to Alan, Alan Fanica, arguably the greatest 66 in LSU history. I think you'd be pretty hard pressed to find a better 66 than Alan Fanica. So, Shout out to him. Shout out to the Arkansas Razorbacks. That's going to continue to be a fun rivalry, and we'll see if they can compete with LSU inside of Tiger Stadium this year. Time to move on and talk some NFL coming up next segment, and we will do that and more coming up here on Middle Relief, 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Middle Relief with Mario and Musso on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Welcome back in to Middle Relief. Mario Jerez alongside Jeremy Hill, former LSU Tiger, former Cincinnati Bengal. And speaking of former LSU Tigers and Cincinnati Bengals, we have a quick update on Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase. Ben Baby wrote about him at ESPN.com, and he kind of recapped the recent seven-on-seven -seven session where Joe Burrow was throwing the ball to Jamar Chase, and he was throwing the ball to Jamar Chase frequently. Ben Baby writes that, he was quarterback Joe Burrow's go-to target during one stretch of a drill that featured zero incompletions. Chase will have adjustments and improvements to make this offseason, but the Bengals are banking on him to be an immediate playmaker. Jamar Chase said, or Joe Burrow said about Jamar Chase, I'm excited about where he's at. He's a really smart player that understands what we're trying to do in the offense. And it's really exciting. We've said it on this show before. The combination of what these guys did in college now on the NFL level is going to be something that the Bengals hope they can replicate, right? And Joe Burrow had a lot of influence when it came to drafting Jamar Chase. Zach Taylor has admitted as much. It's not like they drafted him only because Joe Burrow said so, but they were definitely in his ear about the possibility of drafting Jamar Chase. That has come to fruition, and now they're getting some work together, getting ready for the upcoming season. Most definitely. And uh, I think before the draft, I mean, I think everyone had, uh, before last year's draft, I think everyone had uh, Jamar as a better receiver than Justin Jefferson. And we all saw what Justin did in the NFL's rookie year. So you would hope that uh, Jamar can just uh, replicate that and just be himself. I think he can just go out there and just be Jamar. He's going to make a ton of plays, especially with Joe leading the helm. I'm excited to see that connection link up and score some touchdowns. Uh, they're going to be definitely formidable for the next coming seasons. That 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 rapport that they uh, developed that season was magical to watch, and I'm excited to see them uh, replicate that. Are you worried about the offensive line? Because that's kind of the trope when it comes to Bengals yeah. Twitter and Bengals fans. They're really, really pumped for Jamar Chase. They're really, really pumped for Joe Burrow. But – some guys need to step up along that offensive line that have not so far, and that seems to still be a worry. But what I will say is I know the NFL is is different from college, obviously, but me and Musso were talking about Joe Burrow kind of cleaning up the, uh, the, the weaknesses of LSU's offensive line. They won the Joe Moore Award back in 2019, but a lot of people would argue that Joe Burrow disguised some of that. So maybe he could do a little bit of that in the NFL, but get at the work a lot harder because protection is very important as they already learned the hard way. 
Yeah, most definitely. Like I always mention on this show, their division that they're in, that all those defensive lines are very formidable. They're going to come after the quarterback. You look at Pittsburgh, you look at Baltimore, you look at Cleveland. They all have great defensive lines, and that's something that the Bengals are going to have to get figured out very fairly uh, soon uh, when they start the season. But if you if there was a quarterback to pick to, to go against that and have all his back against the wall, it'd be Joe Burrow. Um, we've seen him do it time and time again, and if there's a quarterback that I would want to believe in and, and uh, charge behind, it'd be him because he has the pocket presence and he has the escapability that's very underrated to me. I think that's a big part of his game is the way he escapes the pocket and keeps his eyes downfield and finds his receivers downfield. It, it's so beautiful to watch. So I think Joe can continue to do that. Hopefully he can stay healthy, and uh, they can they can make a run in the uh, AFC uh, North. He's determined to stay healthy. He's trying really, really hard to get back for week one, and Joe Burrow is a very driven person. I'm pretty sure he's going to be on the field week one. But we'll see. Cincinnati getting some work from their uh, second-year quarterback, Joe Burrow, and their rookie wide receiver, Jamar Chase, that will catch, cas- catch passes from Joe Burrow. And a guy that's caught a lot of passes in the NFL, retired recently, and I'm talking about Demarius Thomas. Thomas was the first of two first-round picks for the Broncos back in 2010. We all remember the other, Tim yeah, Tebow. Yeah. And those guys had a very memorable moment together. But... Demarius Thomas had a much better career. He finishes his career as the team's second leading receiver, 9,055 yards, only behind one player, which is Rod Smith. He's the third in franchise history, or he's third in franchise history when it comes to total catches, 655, which is also only behind one person, Hall of Famer Shannon Sharp. So this is a guy that's a legend in a franchise that has had many legends, 10 NFL seasons, 724 catches, 9,763 yards to go with 63 touchdowns. He also did a lot of good work for Mario's fantasy team over the years. So very grateful to Marius Thomas. One of the, I don't want to say great wide receivers of this era, but maybe a guy that was a little bit underrated throughout his time in the NFL, never really had consistent quarterback play. And I think his, yeah. his proudest moment being catching a pass from Tim Tebow yeah. kind of speaks to that. You know, he catches a slant route or a crossing route whatever it was over the middle, but he does all the work on that play, takes it 80 yards to the house. That's kind of my lasting image when it comes to Demarius Thomas, and he had a really nice NFL career. Most definitely, and uh, us NFL uh, NFL players call him Bebe. That's his nickname, and uh, we got I had some legendary battles with him, Monday Night Football, going up there to Denver, and that dude just wreaked havoc on our secondary year in and year out. Just a tough physical receiver, big, fast, strong. He can run, uh, make contested catches and had a, a hell of a career. So uh, definitely congratulations to you, uh, Demarius. I'm proud of you. Had a sensational career, and uh, good luck to you uh, after football. He had a great career. I'm sure whatever he's going to do after football, he'll be very successful in. And I wanted to talk Saints here, but there's a lot of debate in the chat going on about Arkansas and LSU and the rivalry and whether <laughs> or not it is a rivalry. And somebody uh, a couple comments ago made a really good point about uh, the LSU game is pretty much like the Super Bowl to Arkansas. <laughs> and I think that's true because recently, I think it was last season, somebody did like a poll of the most hated team in each state, which was college or pro. Yeah. And Arkansas obviously was LSU. And it wasn't <laughs> just Arkansas. It was kind of like the surrounding region. So they obviously consider it a rivalry. But as somebody who's been in the LSU rocker room and somebody who's never lost to Arkansas, <laughs> as you said, do you consider it a rivalry? Uh, <laughs> yes, I do. Only because of where it used to be positioned, because I think we used to play it on Friday, which made the game feel a little more special. Yeah. And then I think they may have moved it back to Saturday, but when they used to play it on Friday, it just has a special feel to it, especially that Thanksgiving week. I remember just not being able to have Thanksgiving with your family because you're playing Arkansas. So it just had a little special feel to it. So I wouldn't just throw it out of there because, like I said, they play us close a lot of games. We don't just blow them out every year. So, yeah, I'd say it's a robbery. I respect them. I know they haven't beaten LSU that many times over the year, but they've broken our hearts enough, I think, right, as LSU fans. I mean, everybody brings up the 2007 game, but the 2015 game was a really bad loss. I mean, LSU – comes off the loss to Alabama, which some, which most people expected. Maybe not for them to get drummed the way that they did in Tuscaloosa, but they were supposed to come back, play Arkansas, a team that had like one SEC win in the prior two years and take care of business, but they didn't. And that was kind of the beginning of the end of the Les Miles era, Jay Hill. They lose three games in a row uh, to finish that season, and then they beat Texas A&M at the very end. The whole debacle happens with Les Miles and Joe Oliva, but that's very memorable too. And again, Arkansas hasn't had much success against LSU over the years, but they've had enough to where I still respect them, and I respect the rivalry. And as a fan and as a broadcaster, I would say LSU versus Arkansas is a rivalry. 
Yeah, I will say so, too. And then you got the trophy involved in the bragging rights. I know uh, a lot of people say, you know, we've been kicking their butts, but Alabama's kind of been kicking our butt, and people still consider that a rivalry. So can't just throw that out. Um, you know, Arkansas's got to play us tough year in and year out, especially for the last game. So definitely a rivalry, in my opinion. Well said. And, okay, since we're on the Razorbacks, let's talk a little bit about the current team, I guess. Do you think that maybe some people are sleeping on Arkansas as, like, a potential not contender in the SEC, but – stack up some wins, maybe be bowl eligible, maybe screw up some people's seasons along the way. I mean, they're bringing back a lot of experience. On offense, K.J. Jefferson is a guy that's been in the system for several years but hasn't really been the full-time starter. Uh, he's a sophomore, but he's been he's been playing for Arkansas for three years. This year, he'll finally take over for Felipe Franks, and he has a really good wide receiver to throw the ball to when it comes to Trayvon Burks, who was an all-SEC wide receiver last year, 51 catches, 820 yards and seven touchdowns. They do lose Mike Woods, who is their second leading receiver. He transfers to Arkansas, but you have an experienced quarterback and you have an all SEC wide receiver to go with Sam Pittman as a head coach. And you know, he's going to have a quality offensive line blocking for all of those guys. And then when you look at Arkansas's defense, they straight up might be a little bit underrated. They return nine starters on Barry Odom's unit. Who's a really good coordinator, by the way, including first team all SEC linebacker, Grant Morgan. Morgan was second in the SEC in tackles with 111, which is a lot. And by the way, they have two guys on defense that were all SEC second team players in safety, Jalen Catalan and Bumper Poole, the linebacker. Yes, his name is really Bumper <laughs> Poole, yeah. but he's a second team all SEC performer. And again, Barry Odom is a really good coordinator. So a lot of experience, tangibly a lot of talent for Arkansas with these all SEC performers. And Sam Pittman is a guy that many people respect as a head coach. So again, I'm not saying they're going to be contenders <laughs> yeah. for the SEC West, but they are bringing back a lot. And Arkansas might be a team that some people are sleeping on this year. Yeah, I, I would have to see how they play to start the year. I wouldn't go that far quite yet, just because only the SEC West is so tough. You think of AM, you think of LSU, you think of Auburn, and then Arkansas probably falls somewhere after that. So until you, I feel like they'll be formidable against those teams, I don't, I'm not sure I'm going to pick them to have the success that you would think they want to have. So, I don't think they're there yet, but we'll see. It's to be determined. We'll see how they come out this I fall. Mean, they're a little close, Jay Hill. Tangibly, they're close. Again, I know three and seven is not good, but for a program that won one SEC game in two years, that's really good. And we mentioned the game against Auburn that they lost because of a bad call. No other way to say it. I mean, the SEC officials came out after the game and said that that Bo Nix play should have been a fumble, but they lose that game by two points. They had some other close losses, a three-point loss to LSU, obviously, when TJ Finley has to take the Tigers down the field all the way at the end of the game. Then they lose 50 to 48 in overtime to Missouri. So this could have easily been a six win team that was bowl eligible last year that was building on that. So again, three and seven, not good, but there is progress being made at Arkansas. You can't doubt that. And I don't blame their fans for expecting them to build on that this year. We'll see, but I don't think they're competing with LSU. I'll no. come out and say that right away. Yeah, uh, November 20th. I mean, that's a little bit later in the season. Maybe they kind of find themselves along the way and maybe it's a close game. I don't I don't see them beating LSU today on June 29th, but I do think they, you know, a little bit underrated based on what they're bringing back, based on the all SEC accolades. And all I'm saying is maybe people should pay a little bit more attention to the Arkansas Razorbacks and maybe L some more LSU fans should consider it a ride. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. I respect them. You know, any SEC opponent, I'm always going to respect because they, they recruit well. They're going to come out to play, especially playing against the Tiger. Everyone wants to make a name off of us. So we know that going in. So you got to come out there locked in. Can't ever oversleep, uh, over over uh, look Arkansas going into an SEC football game. And until you can do that, then I'm not going to say it's not a rivalry. And Joseph Clement in the chat brings up a really good point. They're going to get a test right off the bat because we too, they play Texas. So if they can, Clement says that they can pull off three SEC wins where they play Missouri in the East, they may be bowl eligible. I think being bowl eligible is, is a pretty reasonable goal for Sam Pittman's club. Yeah, most definitely. I think that's exactly where, where they should be headed based off of their history. And um, maybe, like you said, they got a lot of guys returning, but I just don't see them challenging the Bamas, LSUs, and nah. the Auburns. Just, I don't think they're there yet. No, but they could stack some wins and just be bowl eligible, which, again, for them, they are making a lot of progress. One in 23 in two years and then three SEC wins last year. They're making progress, and we'll see if we have more memories when it comes to this LSU versus Arkansas rivalry or air quotes rivalry for some people. <laughs> but either way, LSU and Arkansas inside of Tiger Stadium this year, November 20th. All right, time for one more segment before we get to Ask Jeremy at the end. Want to come back and talk a little bit of NBA. Big win for the L.A. Clippers last night. They stay alive against the Phoenix Suns and the Hawks fighting for their season tonight in the Eastern Conference Finals. They might have to do so without one Trey Young. 
All that and more coming up here on Middle Relief with Mario Jerez and Jeremy Hill, 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Middle Relief with Mario and Musso on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Welcome back in to Middle Relief. Couple segments to go here on this Tuesday show. Stay tuned for After Further Review with Matt Moscona coming up in 25 minutes, top of the hour. Matt will cover LSU baseball and football and all the other wonderful topics that he does a great job covering every single day. Uh, wanted to talk NBA here, but the debate continues in the chat uh, about LSU's rivalry with Arkansas and the legitimacy of the rivalry, whether or not it is one. Uh, Emil in the chat points out that Les Miles was 6-5 and five against Arkansas, and it could have been a lot worse. And uh, established journalist Jeremy Hill was over <laughs> here during the break uh, looking up the past series, and there was a lot of one-score games over the years between LSU and Arkansas. So, again, the final record kind of proves to people's point that are saying it's not a rivalry, 42-22. to 22. The games are always fun. Yeah, most definitely. I think that's really all you can ask, especially uh, being on the Tiger side, being on the winning side. Uh, you definitely want to have more wins than losses, and we definitely have that part covered. But Arkansas does come to play when they play the Tigers. Obviously, it's a rivalry for them. Probably their biggest game, especially uh, if they're having a losing season. They want to play spoiler and, and ruin our bowl chances and ruin our, our goals and dreams. So I definitely respect those guys. Maybe the chat doesn't, but I definitely respect the Razorbacks. As do I. As do I. I would call it a rivalry. Maybe there are bigger rivalries, you know, like Auburn and People people get mad when you bring up Alabama as a rivalry, but from the LSU point of view, it definitely is a rivalry. Just like from the Arkansas point of view, it definitely is a rivalry. But we're talking from the LSU point of view, but regardless, LSU, Arkansas, November 20th, we're spending way too much time talking about Arkansas. <laughs> Not even just this hour, Jeremy. You missed it in the first hour. They had an award show because CST airs uh, Arkansas programming sometimes, and they had an award show called the Hogsby's. It's Arkansas's pin on the ESPYs, and oh, goodness. we had a lot of fun with that. Uh, Paul George is having a lot of fun in the NBA playoffs. And think about it, Jeremy. The last time Paul George was in the Phoenix Suns arena, he was missing two free throws at the very end of of that first game. Pretty much choked. The pandemic P uh, (laughs) narrative was back, but he has very much made up for it, man. Last night, 15 and 20 with 41 points, 13 rebounds, and six assists. Three steals as well, doing it on the defensive end as the Clippers beat the Phoenix Suns 116-102. to 102. They stay alive in the series. The Clippers now lead three games to two, and you could tell how nervous Chris Paul is getting from his facial expressions. The Clippers are now the only team to overcome a 2-0 deficit twice in the same postseason. They now trail into conference finals 3-2, to two, and they got to be feeling pretty good about themselves going back to game six in L.A., especially with how well Paul George is playing. Yeah, you could see the Suns uh, let an opportunity slip away last night. You definitely don't want to be going back to L.A., uh, with them getting the momentum and getting a chance to bring it back to a game seven. Uh, obviously, Chris Paul has been this uh, been in this position before, giving up a couple 3-1 leads. And so he knows very, very uh, well what this feels like and what he doesn't want to happen. So obviously, I'm looking for Chris Paul to step up a little bit and be the leader and the point guard that I know he's capable of being and uh, making this a series. But I, I think the Clippers got a lot of momentum right now. I think Paul George, at 31 years old, has grown up. He's matured a lot. I think you can kind of see it. And you got to give credit to Tyron Lue because he's gotten – the absolute most out of Paul George and all this is without Kawhi Leonard on the floor which makes it that much more impressive but a lot of people have been defending Paul George today I've seen a lot of you know Paul George apologists are saying oh where are all the Paul George haters at now but I think that's a little bit overblown let's not act like he did not have a reputation of choking before this because he did and it took him a little while again 31 years old but he seems to finally kind of be shedding that mantra but Paul George built that reputation for himself with the two missed free throws, with some of the stuff he's done off the court. I remember in the bubble, he had an exchange with Damian Lillard, and we all remember the playoff <laughs> series a couple years ago when Paul George was on the Thunder, Dame Lillard makes the buzzer beater, sends him home, and waves. The next year, when Paul George was on the Clippers and they were facing the Trailblazers in the bubble, the Clippers eliminated the Blazers. And Paul George bragged about it on Twitter, saying, oh, one, two, three, 3 Cancun, replying to a Patrick Beverly post, And Dame responds to it and is like, you're a clown, keep switching up teams. And a lot of people were kind of on Damian Lillard's side. But not only that, but earlier, or or as those playoffs went on, Paul George played really badly. The pandemic P mantra came up, and he was saying that a big part of why he was playing badly was because his mental health, and specifically people on social media, (laughs) clowning on him. How are you going to clown on Dame Lillard on social media and then say that people are affecting your play with the mean stuff they're saying on Twitter? I lost a lot of respect for him when that happened. But again, he seems to have kind of grown up 15 to 20, 
41 points with 13 rebounds in an elimination game is nothing at all to sneeze at. So Paul George is finally breaking out and shedding that reputation, but let's not act like he didn't build that reputation for himself. Yeah, most definitely. And I think I also saw a stat last night. Um, the players with, with the numbers that he's put up since he's been in the playoffs, I think it was his 10th or 11th season, uh, only player was, players with better numbers is LeBron and KD. So it goes to show what he's capable of in the playoffs if he has it going. Obviously, he hasn't had it going in a couple series, especially with the Thunder and last year with the Clippers. But if he plays like this, the Clippers are going to be super tough to beat. Um, Paul has it going. He, he's showing everything. He's driving shooting threes, mid-range game going. He got everything going right now. So. Playing defense. Yeah, and he's playing defense. They're, the, the Clippers' defense have definitely stepped up a lot. They're super scrappy. They're getting a lot of stops, making a lot of runs. And like I said, man, the, the, the momentum is definitely swinging back to the Clippers. And, and they could easily be up 3-2 uh, or uh, up the series over 4-1 or at this point, especially if playoff P doesn't uh, miss those free throws. So uh, I'm excited to see how this series goes. Ty Lu has done better work than any other coach in the playoffs, in my opinion. And you heard me. I, I admitted with, in your presence that I was wrong about Ty Lu. I did not think he was a very good head coach after he won the title with the Cavs. I thought, you know, that was all LeBron. And coming into this year when the Clippers were, you know, staying at the top of the conference standings the whole time, I thought that was because Kawhi Leonard was on the team, because Paul George was on the team, and because Ty Lu pretty much lets them do whatever they want. But again, <laughs> How wrong was I? Look how good they're playing in the absence of Kawhi Leonard. Look what they're getting out of Terrence Mann. Look what they're getting out of Reggie Jackson. These guys were not doing this before Tyron Lue was their head coach. And then again, the Coup de Gras is what he's done with Paul George, who is playing the best basketball of his career. So Ty Lue, if they had a Coach of the Year award specifically for the playoffs, Ty Lue would definitely take that home. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Just the adjustment he makes game in and game out. I think last night they started off the starting lineup without a, without a center. They went small and they played a lot of zone and it kind of uh, shook up Phoenix a little bit. And those are the things you got to do in a playoff series when you need to make adjustment. And T. Lou seemed to make every right adjustment all throughout these playoffs, going down 0-2 to the Mavs and the Jazz series as well. So um, I'm excited to see how this Game 6 and Game 7, if I had to predict, I'm going to say the Clippers uh, bring it back for Game 7. How nervous do you think Chris Paul is right now? Oh, he's super <laughs> nervous. He's super nervous. He, I think he would be less nervous if he had it going, but he, he the three-pointers aren't falling. I think he's like 0-9 for 9 in the last three games or something like that and he just doesn't have it going offensively. So he's going to have to figure it out. The, the Clippers are doing a phenomenal job on him thus far in the series, though. Game five tomorrow night, and the Hawks are hoping they have Trey Young tonight. He is questionable. After he had a very unfortunate <laughs> encounter with the referee, uh, 36 seconds to go back in the third quarter of game three, he inadvertently stepped on the right foot of one Sean Wright, who was the head referee in that game. Feel really bad for Sean Wright. You know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are kind of getting after him, but just wrong spot, wrong time, nothing he could do about it. But just terrible timing for the Atlanta Hawks, who won the first game in this series. They almost had game two, had a seven-point lead late in that one before the Bucks come back. But I was already kind of saying this series was over. I think the Bucks have kind of figured things out. Uh, with Coach Budenhoser and kind of stabilizing Trey Young and, and John Collins and all those guys that have been playing so well. But now with Trey Young going down, that, that just magnifies that even more. And I have a really tough time seeing, frankly, how the Hawks win even another game in this series. Yeah, I think the Bucks are definitely uh, – they, they figured the, the, the Hawks out a little bit. I, I saw the adjustment that they made. They stopped uh, fighting over those picks and started switching those pick and rolls with Trey Young, which I think is the thing to do. And you make him ISO and hope he gets tired and hope he starts missing. Because when he can come over those pick and rolls and get in the paint and get those floaters off, he's going to kill you every time. Then he's going to start throwing those lobs. So I think Coach Budenhoser made the proper adjustments in this series, switching those pick and rolls, and I think it's going to benefit them. I think they – they're, they're probably going to win this uh, series in five games. And Pelicans fans are paying a lot of attention to that. It's exactly what Mike Budenhoser is doing because his assistant, Charles Lee, is one of the candidates to become the Pelicans' next head coach. And we were talking about it with Jake Madison uh, early on, earlier in the show, and the Bucks are kind of a defensive team, but they've also kind of ramped up their offense and played fast where they needed to. So Charles Lee and Mike Bo Budenhoser are both doing a great job over there. But the Hawks now become desperate, and without Trey Young's services, it's going to be really, really hard for them to beat the Milwaukee Bucks. So the playoffs have been really exciting either way. I mean, it's really nice to see all this fresh blood, and unfortunately it's kind of culminating, but the Western Conference Finals are really, really entertaining with, with uh, the Clippers and the Suns, but I expect the East Conference Finals to end uh, rather soon. Yeah, I think so as well, especially with a hobble, Trey Young. He already had to play like Superman just for them to be competitive. If you saw the game he had in game one and then the game he was having in game three until he got hurt just for them to be competitive. So I look for Giannis and Chris Middleton to make a huge uh, charge because they know if they can win this one, this series is pretty much over. Game four tonight, 730 on TNT. The Hawks 
in the Bucks game four as the Hawks look to, look to keep their season alive and avoid that dreaded 3-1 deficit. All right, we have made it to the end of the show. We already have questions coming in. I'm sure a lot of them will be Arkansas related. So get your questions into the YouTube chat using the hashtag Ask Jeremy. Ask us, ask us anything about sports or about life. We'll answer that for you when we get back. Middle Relief, 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. Middle Relief with Mario and Musso on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. We have made it to the end of the show, and that means it's time for hashtag Ask Us, Ask Jeremy, Ask Mario. You guys get the point. So the first one comes in from James Fortenberry. It looks like he deleted it, but I remember what it was. <laughs> he was asking, will LSU's O-line be bad this season? Uh, I think losing Dare definitely hurts our chances, but with the other guys coming back and hopefully someone stepping up, I think we should be fairly formidable and decent. So I'd, I'd say we'll be above average, but it's to be determined uh, how we come out. The answer to your question, James, might be yes. They really, really need some of these young guys to step up. If, if a Xavier Hill or somebody that we don't know about yet can step in and contribute, then that gives LSU depth and the offensive line maybe won't be great, but I'm not going to say they'll be bad. Uh, hashtag ask us from Joseph Clement. Do either of you play any instruments? If so, which ones? I don't. I fairly don't. I, I played a little flute and piano when I was a kid, but I totally forgot everything I learned, so I, I don't play anything right now. Is horseradish an instrument? Shout out to Patrick Starr. No, I do not play any instruments. Also from Joseph Clement, hashtag ask Mario, do you dream in English or Spanish? I dream in English. Not going <laughs> to lie. I think in English most times. Uh, I think in Spanish very rarely, maybe during the football season, but most of my subconscious thoughts are all in English. Thanks for the question, Joseph. Uh, Andrew Brister, hashtag ask us, who is the best QB in the SEC East and who is it for the West? Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, as you're thinking, um, it'd probably be JT Daniels in the East, right? I mean, he didn't face that much competition last year, but or that strong competition, but he pretty much lit it up every time he was in there for the Bulldogs. He's projected to be a really high first round pick. And SEC West, that one's a little bit tougher. I know Miles Brennan uh, made some second all SEC team this yeah. morning, so he's being considered for that conversation. But I'm going to need a second to think about this one, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you lose a couple guys. Uh, you got Texas and m losing their quarterback, Bama losing their quarterback. Uh, a lot of new blood. Yeah, a lot of new blood. But I I'll go with our Tigers. I'm going to go Max or Miles for the uh, SEC West. How about that one? I'm going to assume Miles Brennan wins the job, and I'm going to say Miles Brennan. That's honestly a really tough one to project, Andrew, because you got so much new blood in the SEC. LSU is one of the few people that have an experienced quarterback, at least in the West. I mean, Arkansas will, will say otherwise. KJ <laughs> Jefferson's been there for three years, and we might rehash this argument, but that is the answer. That's who we think are the best quarterbacks in the West and in the East. Hashtag ask us from our man Nookie was getting a blue wrench in the chat, one of Jeremy's proudest moments. <laughs> yeah, definitely part of the ESPN family. Definitely one of my more proud moments. Let me get something in the chat, yo. Yo, yo, yo. So Jeremy has been awesome. He definitely deserves to be a mod. Bilbo, by the way, if you uh, have that Discord request, you should definitely send it to, uh, to Jeremy as well. And speaking of Bilbo, next question comes from him. Jeremy, do you ever consider coming back to LSU football to help the team? Uh, I do, not in an official capacity, though. I try to get the running backs together every year. Uh, something I haven't done in a couple years, so that's something I, I definitely want to do again this season. A lot of running back tradition. Yeah. I would hope Jacob Hester is invited to that event. Yeah. Uh, hashtag ask us from Joseph Clement. If money and time were not an issue, what is your ideal vacation? Ooh. Uh, I want to go to... Uh, Indonesia. I want to go to Bali. I hear I hear a lot of good things about there. So I want to try the food and, and visit that out to check that out. I'd love to go to Dubai. We had Todd Graves on OTB this morning, CEO of Raising Canes. And I know they have a Raising Canes in Dubai, so I would definitely get a box combo. <laughs> and it's really cool scenery. My second answer might be a little surprising. I might go Sydney, Australia. I hear that's a really, really good city. I hear it's a really modern city. A lot of my friends have taken vacations to Australia and said it's awesome. Really expensive. Had to go across the world, but I'm probably going to Dubai or to Australia. Uh, hashtag ask us or ask Jeremy. No, it is ask us for both of us. Uh, from Bilbo as well. Favorite Halloween outfit that you've worn? Ooh. Mine is Harry Potter. I honestly wore a Harry Potter costume like my junior year of high school, and I wore it again as recently as last year because it still fits me and I look cool. Uh, I went, <laughs> uh, I'll probably go Booby Miles. I had the black pleats, the black jersey. I went the whole nine with the uh, black eye paint. 
So I'll go that Friday Night Lights booby miles. <laughs> Hashtag ask us from Bilbo Baggins, favorite non LSU college team cheer. I love Ooh. Sandstorm in South Carolina. Okay. I think that gets everybody so lit before the game when the beat drops. You see the rally towels going. There are many other ones in college football that I'm probably leaving out right now, but mm-hmm. South Carolina comes to mind for me. I'm gonna go uh, Tennessee. How about that one? A little Rocky. What's what's their saying? Rocky Row or something like Rocky that. Rocky Row. <laughs> what, what is their thing? I don't Rocky know. Top. Rocky Top. Yeah, that's what it's called. That's how you know. Yeah, Rocky, Rocky Top. Rocky Road. I can't. <laughs> Rocky Top. I Hashtag. Ask Jeremy. What were you thinking when Miles played for the field goal at the end of the 2012 Bama game? Oh, oh my goodness! I remember that very vividly. It was third. It was like third and three, third and four, and we ran and we ran ISO instead of passing it, and they stuffed me in the middle, and then we kicked the field goal and missed it. I uh, wish we would have passed it on third and short, but hey, hey, what do you know? Shout out to Les Miles. Hope you're well. <laughs> That'll do it for today's show. Sorry for the people whose questions we cannot get to, but we'll be back tomorrow. Me and Matt Musso from 12 to 2, and me and Jeremy Hill from 2 to 3 talking football. Stay tuned for After Further Review with Matt Moscona coming up next here on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge.